So what's up? Welcome to Foundry. Chad Brooks, pastor here, hanging out with Jack Locke, PR Director of Discipleship, Director of Student Ministries. We just had to come out and uh, camp in the 28 degree weather when it's raining a little bit. Mm -hmm. Jack, how uh, how did I talk you into this? Uh, every single day, he just kind of was like, hey, let's go camping, let's go camping. And then finally was like, I'm your boss. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but seriously though, you, you didn't do that. I, I kind of did. I kind of did. Yeah. So, Jack, what you know? I've been thinking about going camping for weeks now, and just wanting to do it. And so we're out here. John Steele, who uh, runs the food pantry, works the kids, is, is out here with us too. Mm -hmm. um, like, what man? What are some things that you've enjoyed doing these last few weeks? Uh, just really being able to do youth ministry, you know, because we've had to cut down on a lot of stuff. Yeah. And being able to uh, meet with students and hang out and uh, have fun with that. Uh, and then just kind of like planning for the future and and uh, getting some stuff like exciting stuff ready coming up. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, we sent out an email earlier this week. Um, we're hoping to begin in-person worship pretty soon. Um, the guideline that we had set for ourselves was uh, when we have two weeks in a row of less than ten percent uh, positivity in the parish, and we've had one of those weeks. And so we're kind of yep. fingers crossed and hoping that things um, are coming back in a couple of weeks. We're excited about that, man. I love kind of say I love the worship and prayer night last month. Man, that was that was awesome. We had a Preston Reynolds get up and pray. And yeah, it was pretty powerful. Yeah, it was strong. So we've got another just fantastic event that's in person and live streamed this week coming up on Ash Wednesday. It's February the seventeenth. You know, this has always been a special day in the life of Foundry. These are the days like we. I feel like a lot of times Ash Wednesday are when we are at our most Foundry. Yes, absolutely. If that makes sense. Um, you know, we normally have those services downtown at Flying Tiger. We didn't this year, coronavirus, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, we're doing it in person and we're doing it live stream. And, you know, if you've never been part of Ash Wednesday before, we would invite you to be there. Um, you know, if you are if you feel comfortable coming to the new room, bring a mask. Let's hang out. Let's have, we, let's have a time of just a special worship service together. Um, Jack, I you know, what, what do you think about Ash Wednesday? Like, what are your favorite parts of it? Uh, so, I mean, growing up, you know, I grew up in the church and I, I grew up doing Ash Wednesday, but, you know, when a foundry really first started doing it, uh, I think like the first year was at Governor's. Yeah, we did. This, we did Ash Wednesday at the cigar shop. And then we did it at a uh, brewery. And uh, I don't know, it just kind of really meant so much more to me just because it was, uh, it just wasn't like in one place. Like we were able to like be in the community. We were able to, uh, you know, like uh, move into the neighborhood. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, just it, it just means a lot to me to be able to 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 wear that cross on my head. And yeah, um, it's a cool time. So we hope to see you at Ash Wednesday. We're excited about worship. I'm opening up a two week series called Abide. It's about living in the presence of God. Uh, this next one uh, this today is coming up. It's about our individual. Like how do we individually abide with God and what does that mean? Uh, what does that matter? Um, so we're excited about worship. I'm going to pray us into it. We're going to get things going. So Lord, wherever we are right now, God, uh, let us be enjoying our life with you and enjoying our life together. And so, Holy Father, we pray for us to see you and experience you in new and in different ways. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for the chances to live the life that we live in the place where you've called us and placed us. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. 
those words to the chorus of that song would speak to the depths of our hearts that you would make us your vessel, that we would be an offering to you and be willing to make that sacrifice for you in our lives each and every day, that when we wake up in the morning we commit to the mission that you have for us. to go out and to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever it is that you need me to be this day and going into this week. God, especially going into this next week where we face so much anticipation for what is to come in our world, and so many things that, God, you would be with us each and every step of the way as a community, as a state, as a nation, as a people, one body for you. And above all else, we put our own needs and desires aside to answer the call that you lay on our hearts each and every day. 
Hey friends, thanks for tuning in again today. I'm here at the house enjoying this just cold winter weather. Been cooking a bunch of stuff today. Uh, I know you've been cooking a bunch, just kind of getting ready for a few days, hunkered down. But I want to talk about something that is changing in shape uh, and just changing and shaping in our ministry today. For years, Foundry, especially when we met Sterlington High School, uh, we were just kind of we knew ourselves as a Sunday morning church. That's what we did. We tried to provide a fantastic Sunday morning experience. We tried to provide key relationships that help people grow with Jesus. But as we know over this last year, even in spite of so many obstacles, um, we're at a completely new, different place as a church. Um, our board has been meeting this month, talking about these changes. We've got exciting things to, to share that we're going to wait a couple of weeks uh, just until we get back in person. We're fingers crossing that that's actually really, really close. Uh, but this is also, something we've learned because of 2020 is that we realized that it is incredibly important for us to be thinking about how we as a church are spiritually being formed together. And so I want to talk about, about a couple of things that you've probably heard about a lot over the last few days, but I just want to make sure we keep those right in front of ourselves as a church. The first one is this. We've got our Ash Wednesday service coming up on Wednesday, but we are starting as a church on Ash Wednesday um, a reading plan using the Psalms. You know, we have done different focuses and such like that as a church. We have never pushed anything this hard. And I want to invite you and who you live with, your crew, to consider joining us and joining the whole church in together on this project of reading the Psalms together throughout Lent. And then the second thing is this, you know, we talk about the message notes or the home sheet. Those words are kind of interchangeable a lot, but you know, we create these every single week to follow along with the sermon. Inside of it are these intentional discipleship questions and intentional discipleship prompts. And we feel like this is so important because one of the things that we have learned through 2020, and I'm becoming just deeply convicted about, but it's also the reason we're taking these two weeks to talk about abide, about living inside the presence of God, is that our own personal worship, our own personal time of devotion, our own personal development with God, and our own personal nurturing of the presence of God in our life is super important. In fact, that might be the most foundational practice that we as Christians can have. And if that practice is not there, we're going to kind of be on the struggle bus with everything else in the, in the Christian life personally, much less it's going to be really, really tough for us to move forward and be alongside of Jesus and mission the way that he's created us to and invited us to do. And, and so I just want to just put those two practices in front of you. The idea of us reading scripture together as a congregation through Lent. Um, you'll see links start coming out on Tuesday with downloading that and all sorts of other cool stuff. Uh, but also, what does it mean uh, to just engage with the expectation that, hey, I need to be meeting with the presence of God. We do the home sheets. Uh, that's a particular way for you to do that. But just to put that in front of you, you know, one of the ways our ministry has shifted a lot this last year is we have, have bun begun doing a lot more resourcing because this year has been kind of wild and crazy. Uh, but I would love to see you to be alongside of those two things. We're able to do this ministry. We're able to take the time to create these things, to do these sorts of projects because you give so generously and you believe to a church. Uh, that is trying to follow Jesus as closely as we can and listening for the unique ministry that he is asking us to be part of. And so I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. Uh, we're going to take about a minute and have a, the time of giving. And then I'm going to jump into this first message um, that we have in John. Uh, let's pray together. Holy Father, we thank you for how you are with us, God, for the ways that you move among us, for the things that you are doing. And so, Lord, we ask that you um, come alongside of us, God, that you show us, uh, God, that we are able to see these things, Lord, that we are working on the things that you desire for us to be working on. God, we realize that our own heart plays a tremendous part of that. And so, Lord, it is, uh, it's just in our hopes and our prayers, God, that we offer ourselves to you with all that we have, with all that we are, God. Well, we realize that you can do more with what we have than we can do with what we have. And so, God, we, we give today, we give every day with willingness, but also with expectation of seeing you do new things in our midst. And so, let me pray. Amen.
weather we gave uh, everyone on the team and who's participating this Sunday uh, the day off. We want to make sure we kept them home safe and not in harm's way. So uh, Marge Richards is going to read today, uh, but we didn't get together to film this morning. This is all pre-recorded. So I'm going to read for uh, you our scripture passage this morning. It's from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. I'm reading out of the New Revised Standard Version. This is what it says. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make bear more fruit. You've already been cleansed by the word I've spoken to you. Abide in me, and I ab as I abide in you, and just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown in the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, so abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the word of God for the people of God. So I want to tell this legendary story about my family. My dad and his brother uh, grew up about 200 yards through the pasture to their four first cousins. Uh, and, my, and all of my whole family in Hattiesburg, Mississippi kind of lived right around each other. And um, my grandfather, his, his two best friends were his two brother, his two brothers-in-laws. And um, man, they did some fantastic things. But my uncle Burl, uh, he never had kids. He was a welder. He worked offshore in the 50s and 60s and 70s. He built the original World Trade Center. He's one of the welders on that project. Uh, he was awesome. And he could do two things. Number one, he could build anything. But number two, he also really loved his nieces and nephews. And one year, and my dad was a kid, probably eight, nine, ten years old. You know those things when you go to a fair and there's all of the, the swings that are on chains and it rotates like a merry-go-round and the swings kind of end up like getting up high. You know what I'm talking about. So my, my, my great uncles and my grandfather built one of these for the six cousins uh, and they had it hooked up to an old tractor engine that was there. It was just cool. And you know, every cousin, uh, my dad will tell this story and that they had, um, their seat was made for them. And my, uh, one of my uncles uh, built little nameplates for each kid on the back of their seat. And it was, it was super, super cool. And so one day my dad and my uncle Mark, and they're about the same age, um, the families inside the house were all doing something, and they were the only kids that were there. They were the youngest ones out of the whole bunch anyway. And they decided they wanted to go ride the swing. And so they get over to the swing, and they hatch a plan. And what happens is Uncle Mark gets on his swing. And then my dad just grabs another swing and like has it in one hand and stretches as far as he can and manages to turn on the tractor engine, which was running the whole contraption with his foot, and then like immediately run and jump and just get on any swing he can. They thought this way they wouldn't have to bother the adults, they'd get to do their thing, get to have fun. And it worked at first, but the only problem was they didn't realize that when uh, my Uncle Burl built this thing and gave every cousin their own swing, that he knew it had to be balanced. And he knew that it also meant that all six kids needed to be on there for it to work right. Uh, and my dad and his uncle, and my dad and his, his cousin, uh, my Uncle Mark, found this out the hard way um, when they were about 30 seconds into this thing and two things began to happen. Number one, all the extra additional swings started flying around and hitting them in the head. And all sorts of crazy stuff started happening. Also, they weren't sitting on opposite sides of this thing and they unbalanced it all. And so whatever was at the top that kept this thing connected, this thing started falling apart with them riding it and just throwing things everywhere. It was, it was beating them up. They were hollering and screaming because like it was like a legitimate dangerous situation. And finally, the adults in the house realized something was going on. They came outside and they noticed like the two kids were about to die on this homemade redneck carnival ride. And so they rushed over, killed the tractor engine. My uncle Irvin went and got um, uh, a, a crowbar and some stuff and dismantled the thing that that day, so it never could be rode again. There's just this fun story in my family. We laugh about a lot, uh, but it's also a great lesson about balance, about the importance of balance. 
and to understand the dangers of when things aren't balanced and what it can do for us. Over the next couple of weeks, um, we're going to spend some time in the same passage from John 15. And these are the words that Jesus told his disciples on their last night together during that time that we sometimes refer to as the Last Supper. And, and, and inside of these last words of Jesus, we really see Jesus focusing in on things that he wants the disciples to know about what life is going to be like when he is gone. In chapter 15, which Marge read part of earlier just now, it's the abide part of these conversations. And we're going to take a couple Sundays to walk through this idea of what does it mean to abide with Christ and how abiding with Christ affects us. And this week I want us to look at what does it mean for us as individuals uh, to abide with Christ and how that affects our balance when things seem to be chaotic. And next week we're going to look at the same passage of Scripture, but think about it through um, the understanding of the abiding presence of Jesus Christ is with us as a community and how it changes our relationship to the spaces that we inhabit. But the bottom line of both of these weeks is really about us gaining a better understanding of the presence of God and how the presence of God brings us to a place of trust and obedience. And the presence of God provides more clarity than anything else. The presence of God balances when everything else is trying to topple us. So if we think back to what Marge read for us earlier, we've got to start by talking about this whole vine vineyard analogy. I know it's a lot bigger than we might anticipate. Um, you know, with the second that Jesus starts talking about it, his disciples are just instantly clued in to a much bigger conversation. Did you watch the Super Bowl? Are you one of those people that just watches it for the commercials? Like, I hate to admit it, but that's kind of where I am. I normally don't care that much about the football game. But I was over uh, at some church member's house. Uh, we were there watching it, and um, I'm sitting there like, not kind of paying attention. And then all of a sudden, the TV, I see the cable news channel 10 logo. And I get so excited. My whole being began to perk up because I knew that meant Wayne's World was coming on. And I'm sitting there watching this, uh, this, this, this commercial, and you can watch Jack and, ask Jack and Madeline. I had the biggest smile on my face the whole time because the second I saw that News Channel 10, I was brought into a familiar narrative that I knew, and it made me so happy to be there in just that familiar emotional space. The second that Jesus brings up this vine and vineyard thing, the disciples are transported into that space. They're transported into a space of the story of God and His people that have been going on for hundreds of years that is all throughout Scripture. And this storyline is about the careful planting of God for the perfect place for His people and all the things that He did to do this. Psalm 80, verse 8-9 through 9 says this, You brought us from Egypt like a grapevine. You drove away the pagan nations and transplanted us into your land. You cleared the ground for us, and we took root and filled the land. But the vine vineyard thing is also a metaphor for how God's people had failed to live into the balance of God's power and His faithfulness. And you know all these things that God did is an expectation of a harvest, an expectation of His people providing fruit. And we go to the prophet Isaiah, though, and we read this. Now I sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land, he cleared its stones, and planted it with the best vines. In the middle of it, he built a watchtower and carved a wine press into the nearby rocks. And then he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes became bitter. You know, this level of familiarity the disciples had when Jesus began speaking in one of the most intimate spaces they had probably experienced it, they saw the joy and the excitement of what this, this whole vineyard conversation was, but they also realized that part of it uh, was this lament of Israel failing to do what they had been called to do. So think back to those words that Marge read. You know, they see life, they see hope, they see rejuvenation inside of those. This is the world the disciples are stepping into, that God promises, that God prepares, and that we failed, but what we almost see Jesus saying in this passage is this, hey, look, there's absolutely still the ability 
for you to live into this grand vision and desire of God. Abide in me and I will abide in you. You know, Jesus uses language of abiding. And you know, we don't think, we don't throw around that word too much. Unless you're a fan of the Big Lebowski, you probably don't talk about abiding that much. But to abide means to lodge somewhere. It means to remain, uh, to take up a, a habit and, a, and to exist somewhere in a permanent way. It means to take root deeply into something no matter what happens. Abiding is, is language of resilience. And think about this, for God to abide in us means He has taken up a permanent location within us and with us. You know, in all of the spaces that we inhabit, God abides here with us. He remains with us even when we struggle to remain with Him. Ben Witherington says this, Abiding is an ongoing, not already complete process. You know, friends, we don't just abide once with God, but we continually abide with God. You know, abide with me, and I will abide with you. A couple of things just to think about. The first one is this. Abiding means understanding that we cannot do anything without Him. Let's cut to it. The presence of God, it isn't an elite possession to, be, uh, to belong to a special few, but the presence of God is the most important benefit that is given to us by Jesus. And God delights and desires for every single one of us to know the deep love and the deep clarity that comes from abiding in His presence. And He's not just asking us to do with Him without Him doing this with us first. God abides with you. God offers the fullest sense of who He is to each of us. Now, it might be a little crass, but and y'all have heard me say this before. No one wakes up one morning and says, you know what? I'm going to have a crappy relationship with God today. But instead, we all too often unknowingly, we fail to actually abide. And this is not intentional. It's not deliberate. We just don't do the things to make abiding happen from our end. We live in this halfway uh, sort of a world. You know, we split our time thinking, you know, I can give half of my time and focus to God. I can give half, and half of my time and focus uh, to myself. And that should be enough. He's got, he's got half of it over there. But what we find is, A, <coughs> we slowly begin just taking up more and more and more and more of His time to think that we have to be under control of ourselves. And we begin to lose the focus and what does it mean for us to see and experience and feel the love of God and the presence of God with us. You know, we split our time thinking that will be adequate, but we end up giving less and less and less focus and attention to the presence of God. You know, that's how we get frustrated and distant. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt God was not with you? You know, we get to that point when we fail to actually have a relationship with Him. Let me ask you this. How many times have you had a breakdown in a relationship because you simply haven't spent the time to actually have a relationship with that person? Now, I was in a conversation this week with someone about that very thing. You know, when we fail to put time in, we're going to fail to have a relationship. It's the same thing with God. And we get as much as we put in. It's about our levels of spiritual discernment and our either capability or inability to live in God's world. Friends, we've got to take personal responsibility for this. You know, this is the question I'm asking myself right now. What am I leaving on the table by not fully abiding with God and seeing the benefit and fruit of what He has promised to me? The second thing is this. There's a necessary reaction of abiding. So let's go back to that whole vineyard thing. You know, vineyards are cultivated carefully. I remember when I was uh, living in Kentucky, I was cutting through a parking lot one day on campus in seminary, and I looked down, and there were six tomato plants growing in a foot of square ground between parking spaces. You know, vineyards aren't like that. They don't, like, automatically accidentally spring up and bear fruit. There's something that has to be carefully and intentionally done, and they're constantly and always being worked on. You know, the Old Testament 
is just chock full of the intentionality of God in preparing a place for His people to thrive. And we have to treat this with the same level of intent. But as we realize we're treating this with this intent, we also don't forget the fact that God is doing every single thing He can at the level we're living in His presence for us to thrive in His presence. You know, in this passage, we see a lot about the careful work of God. It says that He prunes off everything that doesn't produce fruit. Now, we can read that and kind of feel like weird and awkward and scared and it sounds kind of judgy. Or we can look at the fact that God is saying, you know, I'm just going to take and get rid of every single thing that's dead and that's distracting you. I'm going to remove this worthless growth. I'm going to do this for two reasons. A, I'm going to do this to allow you to see what I am doing and where I'm working. And then number two, I'm going to remove everything that is sucking away nutrients towards things that you simply don't need. You know, what are those things that we have in life that need to be removed in order for us to find greater focus? At this time, I want to let you know, go pop down to the message notes. We create these every single week. We make the home sheet for you to think about stuff Monday through Saturday. We always put intentional discipleship actions in there. And so, you know, if this is resonating with you, go go check out the home sheet. Think about that through this week because this is about us and God saying, I want to give you every single thing you need. You know, God's pruning lets us focus on what actually needs to be focused on. Now, this is the only time in the New Testament we see this language of pruning. John is living now decades after the the death and resurrection of Jesus, decades after Matthew, Mark, and Luke have been written, have been circulating. Paul has been probably dead for 25 years at this point in time. Here's John, the last living disciple, as an old man far beyond his years, the only disciple to not be martyred. They tried to, they tried boiling him in oil. That didn't kill him. They made him live on like an island by himself for a long time. That didn't kill him. So here he is now saying, this is the stuff that we need to know about living a long, long life with Jesus. Now John's being super specific here. Vineyards producing fruit are a symbol of balance against all that seeks to destroy life. From a spiritual standpoint, we talk about this metaphor. It means that the people who are producing this fruit have allowed God to prune them, have weathered all of the storms. They have survived the drought. And they have come through this space as faithful people who are now producing fruit, but also inhabiting the spaces all around them as righteous and fruitful. Now, I want to bring this kind of deeper, more into our real life right now. Leslie Newbigin, this 20th century missionary who I'm currently absolutely obsessed with, says that every one of us, and he, he, he learned this by spending decades as a missionary in India in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And this is what he said, you know, everyone encounters Jesus uh, through three ways. The environment and the culture around them, through uh, people and their assumptions of what faith is, and through Scripture, through the Word of God. You know, as we seek to try to find balance in a life, much less balance as a Christian, you know, we have all sorts of things assaulting us. You know, they seem to take away our attentiveness to things. You know, we are marketed to right now. We are sorted in algorithms. And we are divided up more and more and more by the culture around us in an attempt to create a greater tribalism through fear. Now, this is what we talk about when we ask that question, is Jesus discipling you or is the world discipling you? You know, we come to God inside of a homemade redneck, out-of-balance carnival ride where we're tempting to turn things on, to control things ourselves, and the swings are going all over the place and hitting us in the head, and the entire mechanism seems to be falling apart at our peril. You know, the world tries to convince us that Jesus is not worthy of being our predominant narrative for things. People will also try to use Jesus and the language of Jesus and distort it and attempt to try to control us or sway us to one side or the other to draw more and more lines. And, you know, we get caught up thinking that life is bad and God has abandoned us. But what we realize is we've not just been discipled by the world, which is dangerous, but even more dangerous is sometimes we've been discipled by a false vision of who Jesus is. But what Newbigin talks about is that the Word of God opens us up to the presence of God in a way that truly not just changes us, but changes our outlook on things. And I know from personal experience, very rarely does someone come into a deep appreciation and engagement with Scripture and leave unchanged. 
Because the Bible, when we start to read it honestly and openly, it's going to assault and confront uh, these cultural attempts and these, these false idolatrous attempts at giving us balance because it begins to make us think and realize, but also to recognize what the presence of God looks like because we have aligned ourselves to it. You know, when we begin letting Scripture be that foundational thing, it normalizes the presence of God for us. It, it makes that a part of our everyday life. And so what we're going to do starting next week is this something we've never done before as a congregation. It's something we've wanted to do, and the staff and I and some other leaders realize, like, this is the time to do it. You know, we engage prayer and Scripture together as a congregation uh, in November in a deeply intentional way. And I've loved hearing these stories that have moved out of people's lives and how that affected them. So this is what we're going to do, though. On Ash Wednesday, you know, we're releasing a readings plan using the book of Psalms. And it's just a short daily reading every single morning. We'll do a couple fun things about this. Number one, uh, you'll see on uh, Wait on Fat Tuesday, we're going to still call it that, even though we're not at Mardi Gras, we don't do all the, do all the fun things this year. On Fat Tuesday, we're going to release this reading plan, and you're going to have access to that on a, on a PDF, like a paper download copy of that. But second, we're also going to produce an audio version of every one of these psalm readings every morning. And so as you're going to the work, as you're getting ready, as you're doing whatever's part of your morning routine, uh, you can listen to these and allow them to kind of speak and share over your life. But also you can read and engage with this because we believe there's something about all of us, even though we're still distanced physically on Sunday morning. What does it mean for us as a congregation to be reading and to be praying and to be engaging the Word of God, asking to see it and to see life in a clarifying manner? And we do this together. We do this in our own spaces that God has given us to inhabit and that we are linking ourselves supernaturally in the pursuit of His presence and what His abiding presence means for us. You know, uh, this reading that we're going to do together, it creates a personal habitation for God in our hearts. And so closing, I just want to read a short parable from Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. When we talk about what happens when we begin to seek this balance as individuals. Uh, Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 4 it says this, As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock, and the seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun since it didn't have deep roots. It died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants, so they produced no grain. But still, other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much has been planted. Then Jesus said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. I want each of you I want me in my own life. I want us as a church together to see and to experience the compounding interest of the presence of God in our lives this next season as we come together. This is gospel multiplication that comes about by us realizing where and how we have been planted the places that God has provided for us, the ones that we see and understand, and the ones we don't see yet, and the ones we don't understand yet, but to see those and to take full advantage of the presence of God that's been offered to us in a way that truly changes us and thereby changes everything around us. God says, I will abide in you, and you will abide in me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. God, that, um, that you are always here with us. Got to think of that prayer in the communion liturgy where our love failed, your love remained steadfast. <sighs> Jesus, you don't abandon us. And that has been your song, that has been your action throughout thousands of years, that you are consistently coming to us, coming to your people, and that you are creating fertile spaces for us to thrive. God, all you ask is for us to yield. God, to realize the difference between our self and your will. God, to allow you to prune in order for us to thrive. 
God, I pray for fruits, and I pray for fruit in a way that multiplies beyond our wildest imagined, God. I pray for visions of sustenance and providence here in our community. And God, alongside of those, your divine will coming inside of us and, and lining out how you are asking us to fulfill your mission here. God, I'm praying for those of us right now who feel like we are choked. God, who do feel like an abandoned vineyard. God, I pray for the openness of our hearts to your spirit in this moment. God, and our willingness to, for you to come and for us to experience in you as a healing balm. God, thank you for even greater things. And should we pray? Amen. Should nothing of our efforts and no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain its builders strive to you who boast tomorrow's gain tell me what is your life amidst that vanishing at dawn all glory be to Christ all glory be to Christ our King all glory be to Christ His rule and reign will ever sing all glory be to Christ his will be done, His kingdom come on earth as is above. Who is Himself our daily bread? Praise Him, the Lord above. Let living water satisfy the thirsty without pride. All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. When all Have a good week.